So now I'm going to show you how to do a little bit of a time series application in R. This is a, a data set and an example that I used in my International Monetary Theory cl class. Uh, it's Economics 321 at Northeastern, but it's pretty common for any kind of international finance or international macroeconomics course you might have. So the idea that I'm going to do is I'm going to test an economic hypothesis. In this case, I'm going to test what's called purchasing power parity. And so I'm going to test the idea that the exchange rate between two countries should be equal to the relative prices between goods in those countries. So, for example, if a, if a product costs $1 in the U.S., it should be about 20 pesos in Mexico, and the exchange rate might be 20 pesos to $1. And so the exchange rate comes from that uh, relationship between goods prices. So pretty common, but in economics we know that what's called absolute PPP or absolute purchasing power parity doesn't really work, it doesn't match real life, so they talk about relative purchasing power parity, which is the idea that uh, the changes in those series might have more of a relationship than the levels or the values themselves, and so we can talk about the relative inflation rates versus the percentage change in the currency. So that's the idea that I'm going to test using some real data. Now, the, this uh, script file is available on my website, I put the URL down, and then the data that I got from uh, the uh, St. Louis FRED, Federal Reserve Economic Data site, uh, it's commonly available, but I made a little CSV file with everything in it, and that should be available too. And what I really suggest is that you work with data on your own, test things, change things, make other relationships, see what works for yourself, and the way that you can really learn software is by applying it hands-on rather than trying to read blocks and blocks and code out of a book. So rather than reading code, uh, play with data until you're comfortable, and then you can make it harder. So I left some things a little bit simplified because giving everybody everything at once means nothing can really sink in. So I'm giving, I'm sort of simplifying some things and then uh, leaving that for once you master the, the beginning parts. So here's my code. I use up my courses and then I'm testing this theory about relative PPP. Make sure you set your working directory to your uh, file location. My, mine is in my F it's reading as F, and I use it in the root directory on my flash drive. And then here is my, um, I'm going to read CSV, I'm going to open up this pppdata.csv. And you can see I got four variables, 238 observations. Always check your data. You notice my code, I've got about 81 lines, I think. Um, and that, a lot of it is checking your head to make sure that you are, have what you think you have. So I've got the date, you can see that it's 1999, and it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, so it's going to be monthly. And that's how Fred gave it. U.S. Consumer Price Index, that's U.S. prices. This is actually Eurozone prices, the way uh, this is the code that uh, was given in, in, the, in the data. Uh, we're going to change that. This is dollars per euro and so forth. And so you can see it kind of looks like what we want. Now, I'm going to remove the date column. And I, so basically, I'm going to eliminate column one. Remember that this is minus, meaning it's gone, and comma. Remember, it's row, comma, column. So this is get rid of column one. Now I'm gonna before that before I show you that I'm gonna get uh, make a new variable and this is just to kind of look at we're not gonna use it but this is gonna be called the price ratio p ratio it's gonna be the new data one which is Europe um, U S prices over what's now data two remember this one's gone so this is U uh, S over European prices. And we're going to make a new variable over here. And so data, remember, uh, the dollar sign is a column. And we're going to give a new column with the name P ratio. And so we're going to get rid of column one and calculating using what's left to make a new variable. So this, remember, this is one over two. And so dividing these, we get this price ratio, which is the ratio of the two price levels. If you want to check your work in your head, this is about 2.2 three times higher. All right. So again, a lot of these code is doing the head of your data just, just to make sure that you're not on the wrong track. Sometimes people do a lot of work and then realize there's a mistake about 20 steps earlier. So I'm a big proponent that you check uh, what you're doing as you go. Now, this is undated. This is untimed. There's absolutely no uh, reason that R would know that you're working in time series. Um, in fact, even reading this is a little difficult. So we're going to make a time series using the time series function. So TS data is our new name. Um, and then TS is you know time series you're calling, and then it's in parentheses. You take the original data, and then to tell you exactly what the times are, you start it. And there's also you can end it too. But we're going to start it at um, a combination of this is a this is two things together, 1991, and then the first time. Now remember, R does not know what you're doing until you tell it, so it does not know if it's days or weeks or months or whatever. So then you say the frequency 12. And so it says it's 12 per year. Now if you left this off or said frequency one, it would make all of these a year, and it, and it would go. You'd be, you know, hundreds of years in the future, uh, but because it, it just assumes until you tell it otherwise, it's just going to assume uh, that there's there's nothing happening until you tell it what you want it to do. So we're going to make this, and so now we have a time series of data.
a variable. Now, I am going to change this name because obviously this is really, you know, long and unnecessary. You could just do column two, but I'm going to rename column names of this TS data. And remember, this is a group, and this is in quotes, separated by commas, USCPI, EUCPI, all right? And then that's the one that really gets changed. And then USD per EUR, which is the same name, and then P ratio. And then remember, check your work. And once we run this, you can see that this is short. Right. Now, I'm going to plot all four of these at once, so using the plot command, TS data. And now what I do here is the X label, which is the uh, horizontal axis. I Because it usually will just say time, I don't like that. We know it's time, so I take it and make it blank. So in other words, there's nothing in these quotes. Main is the title, and I just call it time series. You can change it to what you want. So if you run it, here are the four. Now, these kind of squish together, but if you zoom in, you can see that over time, here are... You know, prices are rising, but they fell during the recession and so forth. Now, there's a little bit of seasonality in the EU prices. We're going to get rid of that, um, but you can kind of see these ups and downs, right? So these are probably not deseasonalized. You could deseasonalize them, but again, we're not going to do it here. We're just going to take a different inflation rate. So we're going to take 12-month percentage changes. We're going to use the lag function. Now, one thing I'm going to do is I could have 1,200. I am going to not do that. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave it. Now, because there's 12 months in a year, I am going to uh, make sure that, you know, I keep in mind the fact that you're kind of taking one twelfth of the change over the year. You can annualize this. Here, I'm simply going to just leave it at 100 to keep it simple. But you could put 200 or an extra two in here. In other words, you kind of have to multiply each percentage by 12, uh, by 12 because you're only getting one twelfth of the change per year. I'm going to keep it simple here. And that's kind of by choice. Um, so you're using the traditional percentage change formula. Okay. Now this is the so think of it. You're working out. Now this is TS data column one, and then I'm gonna divide it. Remember, um, you can you can subtract new minus old over old or x2 minus x1 divided by x1. But you could take the ratio and then simply subtract. All right. And so what I'm doing here is I'm uh, going to right take the ratio of this column divided by its lagged value. Now, lags a lot of times are 1, but we're going to take 12. Right, so this is 12 lags previous. And don't forget the minus sign. If you leave the minus sign off, you have what's called a lead, and you'll be actually subtracting over one year in the future. So you're taking uh, you know, February 2019 divided by February 2018, and this set tells you right you're lagging it. Put that in parentheses. And it is 12 periods previous. Okay, and once you have that, it's going to be like 1.02 or something. Then you divide, you minus one, right? Like a traditional percentage change, and then you would get a 0 0.02, multiply it by 100, and you would get two percent, right? And again, I'm not doing 1,200 this time. I'm doing 100, which is just going to give you simply the change over the month, and it's not annualized. So just keep keep in mind we're working out with parentheses, right? So inside the parentheses, you take the ratio, divide over 12 months previous, and this tells you what the lag is. Then one step further out, take that, subtract by 1, and then this next set of parentheses tells you times 100, right? So it's like three levels, right? First you divide, then you subtract, then you multiply. That's that order of operations. All right, so I'm going to make these, and then I'm going to take the inf diff is inflation differential. All right, so I made my two inflation series, right? US, and then column 2 is EU. And then an inflation differential, it takes these new variables and subtracts them. So, for example, if the U.S. had 5% and EU had 2%, this would be 3%. Right? shows you how much one is higher. And in PPP theory, the country with the higher inflation rate should have a weakening currency. And that's the idea that we're trying to test. Percentage change E takes column 3, right, the same formula. And we are going to do the exactly the same thing for column 3. And again, I don't really touch column 4 because it's got seasonality to it. So I'm going to make these. All right, and now I've got my variables, and they pop up over here. And now we're going to start to do some economic and statistical tests. All right, so first we're going to calculate the correlation. Then we're going to make a regression line, and then uh, we're going to kind of show the correlation. And then remember, you make a regression; it's stored. Right, even if you just run this part. It's not going to give you what traditional software would give you, right? It gives you this, and that's not enough to work with. So we're going to make objects, right? The correlation is the solution, the correlation between the percentage change and the inflation differential. Then we're going to make a regression. Now, this is for the linear model. And how you write is LM, and then you call in, this is your sort of your Y variable, and then this is a function of your, uh, this is your 1x. And you could have more x's if you add, but right now this is a bivariate regression. So these are going to be stored, and they're not going to, there's going to be nothing produced. 
but new variables will appear. All right, so here they are. Um, but once you call them here, you get two things. I have to scroll up. You get your correlation, which is 0 0.207, which is not super high. All right, and then here's the summary of the results for your regression. And so the intercept is pretty much zero, and then inflation differential, this is 2.74, but this is significant. So there is some sort of a significant relationship between the two, but you'd have to kind of compare both. All right, so there's a small but significant effect, I would say. All right, so we made a correlation, which is the simplest bivariate measure of association, and they're somewhat associate, associated. And then we did a regression. We, we did the exchange rate on y, or excuse me, the, the y's exchange rate, and we're regressing that on the x, which is the inflation differential, and we showed there is a significant relationship there. Now, to keep going with this, we're going to make a scatter plot. We're going to plot the dot with inflation differential down here, and the exchange rate changes up here, and look for a relationship. We're also going to um, make a... Uh, a regression line, which is basically the slope and the intercept here, and then it'll, it'll show through what the regression would predict, and then the correlation, which I misspelled here, is going to have um, the, the answer, actually. We're going to put this number in the legend. So let's see what we did. I plot, all right, and the way you have to do it is kind of X and then Y, so it looks a little bit backwards from what we ran up here, but this is your X, this is your Y, and then these are just some things about the font to make it look nice, right? So this is the type of dot 16 happens to be the dot I'm looking for. There's actually a table you might want to Google to see if you want diamonds or stars or whatever. But number 16 is the one I chose. I suggest playing around with it yourself. Main is the title. So this is the correlation between inflation and exchange rates. I'm going to call it that. An AB line is basically like axes, right? You can put in um, sometimes a horizontal line or a vertical line, but the, co the command AB line lets you add an additional line to your regression. If you put in just the regression we ran up here, reg 1, it'll get automatically put in that regression, but you could put something like, you know, x equals 0.1, it would plot. So you could put a lot of different things, and I suggest you look into that. And this is the line width, which is fairly thick, and line type 2 is more of a dash. And again, you might want to Google the table, but people refer to these tables. This is just choice, right? I, I'm kind of choosing what I think looks good to me. But I'm going to add a legend to the bottom right. I'm going to call it the correlation equals, and then to kind of save a little space and time, I just add, you know, another line with, with this answer, and I'm going to round it to three decimal places. All right, so here's my scatter plot. And you can see here's this A, B line, the regression line. is pretty flat because it's a pretty weak correlation. Here's the little box I added, and these are all the points, the combinations between the exchange rate changes and the inflation differential. All right. Now, I'm going to do one more thing. A lot of times people calculate averages or means. They calculate standard deviations. Here's something that is kind of interesting is the coefficient of variation. It is the ratio of the standard deviation over the mean. Large values, large uh, or series with large average values tend to have large standard deviations, and so this controls for that. So you can compare things more equally if you control for the fact that l the two values are high or low together, right? So I'm going to make coefficient of variation for both. All right, I'm going to name them CV and then underscore and then the original variable. So again, nothing shows up here because I'm going to now print them, or I'm going to just make them appear. Now, if you do, do run source, which I tend not to for these videos, but if you run source, it'll never show anything unless you put the command print and then put this in parentheses. But for right now, I'm just going to run it. All right, and you can see that it, this is a pretty, inflation has a low uh, coefficient of variation. This is higher, and the ratio of the two, the exchange rate is about five times more variable. And that actually fits economic theory, because economic theory would dictate that exchange rates move more than the fundamentals. They have excess volatility. It's roughly five times bigger, OK? So I am going to uh, show you how to plot them. And I'm going to plot them kind of I'm going to cheat. Uh, you could make two axes. You can make one and then the other. If you, don't, if you don't put them on the same scale, one will look really small and one will look big and they won't look good together. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat and I'm going to put um, one variable is going to be multiplied by five. So I'm simply going to multiply five times the inflation differential. So this is what I'm going to call. I'm going to plot the percent change E right, with the two no x label, and then also no y label, right? I don't need to put the variable name because we know what it is. And then the main, the title, is percentage change in USD over ER and five times the inflation differentials. So that's the title of my chart. And then because of the way the data look, I, I kind of want it to kind of look nice and fit. I don't want it to have a lot of blank space above or below. I've got uh, the, uh, this is the y limit. So it's going to run between negative 25 and positive 25, okay? Then I'm going to plot a new 
thing. So this is going to call add a new graph to the existing one. In other words, it's not going to erase it and make a new one. It's going to add to it. So the PAR and the new is true. Remember, the opposite is obviously false. This says, yes, I want to add, make a new graph on top of it. Then I plot five times the inflation differential. I don't make a new variable. I simply can plot any function of this. And this will be a little thicker. It's going to be a different line type. It's going to be a thicker dashed right, line. And it's also going to be colored dark gray. And I'm going to have the same x and y labels. And also, I'm going to print over the same space. I'm going to plot over this range. All right. And then finally, I'm going to add a legend at the bottom left. And this is going to have the two things. This is the things I'm going to label. And then each these things are paired. Right? There's two things here, two variables. They each have their own width, which matches what I wrote up here. They each have their own line type. Default is one, or a straight line, or excuse me, a solid line. But I've got one and two, because that's what I drew. And the colors are the same. Right? So this is these are all in pairs, and it's going to do everything um, exactly matching what I, want, what I plotted. So I'm going to run this. And this is what it looks like, all right? So this is the annualized, okay? So these are the uh, these are the movement. You can see in black the percentage change in E, and then less less volatile is the inflation differential here. And they roughly kind of move together, especially around 2008. You can look at maybe there's some sort of relationship right during the crisis, but there's definitely an economic story here. Right. Generally speaking, what we found was the relationship between the, the fundamentals and the exchange rate, or the driving force, which is the inflation differential. There is a relationship, but it's fairly weak, um, and the, the exchange rate is a little bit more variable. Now, finally, I always um, plot to high-res files. I use high-resolution files in my work, and I suggest it because you could copy this. You could uh, uh, you know, somehow take a clip or save it. Somehow you could export it. All right, you can save it, but generally speaking, it's default Windows resolution, which is not good for a, a paper or academic paper or print. Right, so if you ever need better resolution, this is what you do. All right, so the, calling the JPEG makes a, J, a JPG file, and this is what I'm going to call it TS4 for my four times here. So the name goes here. This is the size of my image. Right, so it's five by eight. And then the 5 by 8 what? Remember, R doesn't know until you tell it. So units are inches. And then resolution is 600, which is extremely high quality. And then I plot what I have. And remember, I, I tend to leave the X labels off. And then the main is the time series. Y labels are left because it's going to name those four. And then device off says stop printing. Right? If, I'll just do this right now. It just kills it. So it's going to say start printing, plot this, end printing. Right? Notice I'm going to do this over and over. Right? I'm going to have a scatter plot. This is 6 by 3 inches. And I plot the inflation differential. This is exactly what we did before. Only the only difference is I'm saying, don't print it here. Do it as a JPEG, and it's going to print it to the working directory that you did before. So it's going to put it in my F drive, right? And so this just simply repeats it with all different names. And it, you, remember, you have to tell it the name, the dimensions, and the resolution. And what it's going to do is, is uh, if I do it here, it's going to run, and it's running here. You can see, and then finally it kills. And then in my um, up here, these are the things that I made in my folder. So, so it's going to print a file, and you can actually open it up if you want, and you can preview, right? And then this you can pull into Word or or whatever you're working in. Right now, I don't really worry about this, all right? But but here you can see, and it's a pretty pretty high quality image, right? So that's that's what I did. So we're we're working with R. I'm trying to show you the step by step. I'm showing you the thinking behind each step. Uh, but the idea is to take some real data, start to manipulate it, make make a working time series file, check your work as you go, and then the end result is to test an economic theory. And so we found this weak relationship between exchange rate changes and the inflation differentials between the US and Europe.